All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome back for our uh, Thursday lectures. We've switched people, in case you haven't noticed. Uh, we have a new lecturer, Professor Tim Lewin from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Uh, professor Lewin is a Regents Professor, which is the highest uh, faculty honor at Georgia Tech. He holds the David S. Lewis Jr. Chair in the Guggenheim School of Aerospace Engineering. And he's also the executive director of their uh, Strategic Energy uh, Institute. Um, I think one of the things that makes Professor uh, Lewin unique is that he's as equally well-known and renowned in the fundamental combustion communities and the applied combustion communities. His research really spans uh, the entire spectrum, uh, and it's been recognized by both uh, types of societies. Many, he's won every award, basically, but both from the Combustion Institute, from AIAA, from ASME, and he's also a, a fellow of the National Academy uh, of Engineering. But perhaps uh, what I'll leave you with is, is a bit of an anecdote. Um, one of his former PhD students is Professor Jackie O'Connor at Penn State, um, who received her PhD in his group more than 10 years ago, and to this day continues to rave about his advising, not just when she was a PhD student, but also uh, currently in her position now. And so words like amazing and spectacular are used regularly. And I think it goes to speak that uh, Professor Lewin is not only a great researcher, but he also cares not only about teaching, but also the people. So you're certainly uh, in great hands today, and I hope you'll uh, join me in welcoming Professor Tim Lewin. So, is this, this mic on? Back, give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Okay, cool, good. All right, good morning, everyone. Um, delighted to be here. Sorry, I didn't arrive till last night. Um, but uh, this is, uh, I guess, Professor Law and I had breakfast. I guess this is the sixth time I've done a summer school, either in uh, Princeton or in uh, Tsinghua. So, it's always, a, it's always a highlight, and in fact, I was... The reason I wasn't here is I was at another combustion meeting, and it's always fun when alums of this program come and introduce themselves to me um, and talk about past iterations of this, uh, this summer school. Um, so what I want to do today is, is well, you know, this is called Unsteady Combustor Processes, not a great title, but really, you know, I think Professor Law, you know, has written a very, very nice book called, you know, Combust. Gen physics, combustion physics. And I've taken a lot of, I really appreciated the way his approach and uh, just the rigorous approach for combustion science. And so really, the uh, I wrote a textbook called Unsteady Combustor Physics um, with the idea that, you know, if you start, if you take combustion science and then you start opening that up to the intersection of combustion science with fluid mechanics, with acoustics, um, and some broader system level issues. So in other words, the difference between combustion and combustors. There's just a whole set of really, really interesting um, basic science issues, um, applied, uh, applied uh, science issues, and so forth. And the idea, and the idea here is to, um, for the next six hours with you, is to spend some time on really kind of a snapshot on some, some um, really important practical issues, but then flowing those back to the, um, some of the more basic combustion fundamentals. So I'm going to talk about flame stretch, I'm going to talk about edge flames, I'm going to talk about um, uh, flame aerodynamics and things like that, but I'm also going to tie that back to, from a practical point of view, why those are super important problems. Um, and I'd say this is, um, this is kind of, like Mike mentioned, I, I really enjoy working on problems where there's a where there's a really critical real-world need, but then it flows back into a really interesting basic science issue. And that'll be kind of be the tenor of the discussion here. Um, will anyone here be at the Gordon Conference on laser diagnostics in a week and a half? Okay, so I'm actually, <laughs> I've been thinking about shifting things up a little bit because I'm actually giving a plenary talk on Sunday night on the future of combustion and combustion R&D, uh, which I'm sure is a, question in many of yours mind. So what I was thinking about doing was maybe after this is inserting that, which means the two of you will see the presentation twice, but you can all, it'll be a dry run and you can give me constructive feedback. But uh, I think now more than ever, you have to, you, you know, there's great, super interesting basic combustion um, science, basic combustion physics problems, but you can't put your head down. You have to understand where the technology is moving because that's motivating sets of problems, 
And you have to really keep an eye on the public conversations um, and policy, because that's also really influencing where the... Uh, where, where and so I think, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to, that's, a, that's an extra 35 minutes, which means I'm going to trim some other stuff. But I think just to kind of give you my best view of kind of at 50,000 feet, where is um, combustion, what is going to be the drivers for fuels as energy carriers? What are going to be the drivers for combustion, combustion as a technology for our society? And then how does that flow to those who do combustion R&D? Um, so, there we go. Um, okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, you bet. Just move it. Should be much better. Thank okay. You so yeah, you bet. Yep. So, um, just a couple of the different books that I've that I've put together on different types of combustion. Oh man, I got to get rid of that. All right. Um, uh, that's going to be distracting. Uh, and that off. There's another screen that I'm not seeing. My mouse. There it is. Right. Yeah, just uh, so um, I just came out with a second edition of this book, Unsteady Combustor Physics, which was sort of my attempt to sort of bring together combustion science, fluid mechanics, vorticity dynamics, and, um, and compressional wave dynamics, acoustics, and things like that, because those three all interact really tightly in combustion systems. And uh, there's some super interesting problems that, um, that arise at their intersection. We actually... Work, uh, my connection is Jackie O'Connor, so she and I worked together um, along with Bobby Noble from EPRI to produce this book uh, called Renewable Fuels. Just thinking about fuels that are not coming out of the ground from fossil fuels, but that are manufactured. Manufactured via like a Fisher Tropes process uh, or from a biological process, so sustainable aviation fuels or hydrogen or ammonia. Um, and you know, how do we make these fuels? What are the issues we need to think about as you start inserting them into fuels, devices that you utilize fuels, and then it has some case studies for application. Um, gas turbine emissions on the top right. This is a, this is a really important topic right now. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussions today around decarbonization and reducing the CO2 intensity of our, of our society. And so that has clear implications on combustion. But combustion and fuels are going to play a really important role. Um, even in a net zero society, and, I, and, I, and I'll, when I walk through that that Gordon conference presentation, I'll, you'll you'll see some of that. But um, but increasingly, I would say there's public scrutiny on the not only the CO2 emissions but the pollutant emissions, so particulate matter. So I was delighted to have breakfast this this morning with Professor Michelson and just talk about particulates because particulates have always been important, but they're really if you look at you just open New York Times or. This is what people are talking about. Um, uh, or uh, NOx, nitrous oxide emissions. Um, you know, a lot of discussion right now about hydrogen. You know, if you burn hydrogen, you can still make a lot of NOx. So if we go to, if we go to a hydrogen economy, what does that mean for air quality? Um, so anyway, so I would just say generally the issue of, of emissions is important. And then the bottom right, combustion instability, which is a topic, actually this is a topic that that Princeton played in, you know, a lot of the seminal work was performed at Princeton, um, and it continues to be a really important issue, which we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so the way this is going to work is I'll spend about an hour with you today. Actually, I'm going to extend it because I said I want to give you that talk. Um, uh, really just kind of framing kind of high-level issues, and really this is going to have a, you know, combustion is a big, broad, wide field. There's a lot of application areas. So the application area is that I'm going to kind of contextualize these basic research, basic science questions around would be what I would call steady flowing combustion systems. So like boilers and furnaces and gas turbines, things where it's flowing through, you know, not a reciprocating engine, not a forest fire, um, and, and so forth. Um, and so then what we'll, we'll do is we'll spend, um, you know, uh, in section B through E, We'll talk about different, really interesting, again, really interesting problems, like the problem of flashback. 
where a, where a premix flame shoots up stream. Um, it's in every basic combustion textbook, but I'll just tell you what's in every basic combustion textbook just glosses over all kinds of really important and interesting physics. Is because combustion interacts with the flow. The, it, you always have flashback in a boundary layer. So I'll, as I'll show you, the flame back pressures the boundary layer. The flame is curved, and whenever you have a curved flame, it does some really interesting things to the flow. The flame can actually separate the boundary layer in front of it. So it's like, to use a biblical illustration, flames are almost like Moses parting the Red Sea in front of him because the flame, the curved flame can back pressure the boundary layer, cause the boundary layer to separate, the flame can move forward. You know, so, so just lots of really interesting stuff. So I want to give you a feel for that in that, in that section on, on flashback. Um, then I'm going to talk about, and, and see, talk about flame stabilization. How is it that flames can actually sit? You know, if we're talking about steady combustion systems like gas turbines or boilers, you basically have a flame that's just parked at a fixed location indefinitely. How does it stabilize? And I, again, what I'm going to show you is there's a lot, again, this is in, if any basic combustion book will have this, but there's a lot more to it. Um, and some really interesting things that, that happen there. Um, then in D&E, I want to talk about... Um, uh, so, so um, uh, other unsteady combustion problems, and I want to talk about disturbances in combustion systems. I want to talk about acoustic waves, I want to talk about vortical disturbances. I, I want to show you a, a, how, you can, how you can think about decomposing disturbances in general. And then the last section I want to think about kind of uh, what's, what does a flame transfer function look like? If you, if you perturb a flame, what's the space-time response of a flame? Really important question for uh, for combustion instabilities, and really kind of again the, the 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 key course themes as I have in this blue box is you know basic physical and chemical processes. How do these flow to transient or time harmonic or stochastic unsteady combustion problems, and then how does that flow to operational limits of combustion devices? That um, let me just stop for a minute and see, does anyone have any questions or anything? And, and feel free to raise your hand throughout this. Um, all right. So let's just, um, I, I, so drilling in now, so the four bullets on the right, I want to chat, just kind of do a quick high pass on some of the things that we care about when we uh, design combustion systems. I want to talk about constraints and metrics, what makes a good combustor, what makes a bad combustor, and then... Um, I want to talk about emissions a little bit, um, and uh, I can go as fast or slow through this material just depending upon what everyone's background is in this room. So just, okay, simple example, since we're talking about steady flowing combustion systems, let's talk about a gas turbine, you know, brightness on it, where you have flow going through a compressor, it gets compressed, flows at nearly constant pressure through a combustor, and you have this, what I'll call PR, I'll call that the compressor pressure ratio, that's the, the, the ratio, that's essentially the pressure of the, of the reactants in the combustion chamber. And you know, you can have what we call a simple cycle gas turbine, um, where you just have the basic Brayton cycle, or you can have a, um, what's on the bottom, you can have a combined cycle where you take the hot combustion products and you boil steam, and that steam you run through a steam turbine, we call a bottoming cycle. Um, and if you look over at the top right here, on my mouse, um, I don't know if you can read that, but this is a kind of a, this, a plot, this is some, a calculation from General Electric, but the top left is the thermal efficiency, so just the, the, you know, how efficiently fuel is converted into useful shaft work. Um, and the x-axis is what we call specific power. It's the measure of, of the power density of the device. So, you know, how much power do you get for unit mass flow rate? So if you need to get one megawatt of power out of this device, how big does it need to be, right? Does it need to be this big or does it need to be the size of this room? And so this plot just shows you how the, both the efficiency and the specific power depend on things. And, and remember, those are very different parameters. In many cases, if you want a higher efficiency device, you're going to trade off on, on power density or specific power. And so the um, it has ISO lines, right? So the ISO lines that are horizontal are pressure, 16, 14, 12, 10. Um, 
The world's really moved on, by the way, since these numbers. Um, and so, you know, kind of state-of-the-art systems are now higher pressure. But, um, uh, but uh, and what that shows you is, as you go up in um, pressure ratio, you go up in thermal efficiency. So you'll all have known that from thermo. I'm still not good. Is your pack on? <laughs> also. Oh, did I forget to turn it on? Oh, man. man. Yes, that's the problem. That would explain it. Yeah, sorry. The green light. Um, my apologies. Um, yeah, so you go up in pressure, you get more efficiency, right? And so, and so this is why, for example, if you look at aircraft engines today, which are simple cycle devices, they're running at pressure ratios of 50 or 60. Um, uh, because, you know, if you want to go farther on a, gas, a gallon of fuel, you got to go up in pressure. Um, the vertical-ish lines are turbine inlet temperature. These lines right here. So this is the temperature coming out of the combustor going into the turbine. And what you can see is at a given turbine inlet temperature, um, you know, well, as, at a given pressure ratio, excuse me, there is a slight dependent. Uh, you know, thermal efficiency depends weakly on turbine inlet temperature. And really, that dependence in an ideal cycle doesn't depend on it at all. It's only because of losses uh, that, that, that higher turbine inlet temperatures make the system less sensitive to losses. Um, but uh, but the, the turbine inlet temperature has a big impact on specific power, you know, power density. You want more power density, you got to go up in turbine inlet temperature. So you can kind of think of, from a practical point of view, the y-axis is like fuel cost. You know, how much fuel do you need to do a given amount of work? The x-axis is kind of upfront capital cost. You know, how much, how big does your device need to be? Um, now, the, the world kind of flips a little bit when you look at a combined cycle down here. Now notice that these more horizontal-ish type lines are actually uh, turbine inlet temperature. So in fact, for a combined cycle, you want to go up in turbine inlet temperature if you want more efficiency. Um, we're going to come back to this point because there's some really interesting basic combustion problems that, that come out of this trend. But what you see is, you know, the United States um, today, the number one, the largest source of electric power comes from natural gas fired combined cycle plants. So this is really important. You know, Hundreds of millions of dollars of natural gas are viewed, are burned every single day. So 0.1% of efficiency makes the difference of over a year, billions of dollars. Um, and so people pay a lot of attention to this. And so what this has done is it's people who do thermal barrier coatings and, and heat transfer and sort of the, 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 the highest if, um, piece of the, the most um, of advanced technology on a modern aircraft engine or a gas turbine is the turbine blade because it's grown from a single crystal. And it's riddled with holes and there's fusion cooling. But that's why, is because those things, if you can take the temperature up, you can get more, more efficiency out of it. You can get more uh, power with less fuel. Um, and um, what you can also see is if you look at these pressure ratio lines, which are now this way, is, is that going to higher pressure isn't necessarily give you more efficiency. There's actually an optimum pressure ratio for a given turbine inlet temperature, right? So in other words, if you'd say, okay, hey, my turbine inlet temperature is whatever that is. I can't read it. I want to be at that pressure ratio, which is about 14. And that's is why on combined cycle power plants today, if you look at their pressure ratios, they're a lot lower than aircraft engines. You know, aircraft engines are 40 to 60. Combined cycles are in the 15 to 20, 25 range. And that's why. And basically, what's happening here is, as you go up in pressure ratio, um, the exhaust gas is cooling from a simple cycle, right? And, and why is it cooling? Because you're extracting more of the work from the turbine, which means you're getting less power from the steam cycle. Um, and so there's an optimum pressure ratio. So you get a certain amount of power from the, 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 um, the Brayton cycle, a certain amount of power from the bottoming cycle. And if you want to optimize the sum of those, you get this optimum pressure ratio, which is much lower. But you want to be as high in temperature as you can. So we'll come back to the, both of those points a little bit later. So if you'd say, OK, well, where does the combustor fit in all this stuff? Um, 
Well, let's, let's go back to that ideal Brayton cycle. And actually, here's a formula uh, for an ideal Brayton cycle, which shows the thermal efficiency as a function of pressure ratio and gamma. Here I have that plot of thermal efficiency versus pressure ratio. Um, and if, and in fact, I'll show you a slide a little bit later. You can also make a plot of the temperature coming into the combustor as a function of pressure ratio. And the temperature coming into the combustor is going up and up and up as your pressure ratio is going up and up and up. Um, but what you can see here is, well, the combustor doesn't show up at first order uh, on, on efficiency, right? Which is different than in a, a reciprocating engine where the um, basically um, the max sort of pressure ratio you can get in a reciprocating engine is limited by auto ignition. So combustor has an order one effect on thermal efficiency of a, of a diesel or a gasoline engine. Um, gas turbine doesn't show up. It's, it's, all the, it's all the pressure, it's all the compressor. Um, so very little effect on cycle efficiency, but it has really important effects on lots of other things. And um, so for example, let me jump to that second bullet, engine operational limits and transient response. We're gonna spend a lot of time talking over the next two days about what that means. What does operational limit mean? It means you're, you have a, a system that's trying to do something, but you, it's got certain operational boundaries. There's a certain equivalence ratios it can operate at, certain power settings it can operate, certain ambient conditions it can operate, right? Like you're, if you drive a car, you'll know your engine has certain operational limits. I don't even know what they are, but you know, probably you can't start your engine, I don't know, if it's below 50 degrees, negative 50 degrees, probably the engine won't start. And if it's more than, I don't know, if you're higher than 18,000 feet trying to drive over some pass in the Himalayas, it may not work really well either. Um, and if you try to give it crappy fuel, it may not work. So there, you know, there's all these boxes where you can operate in terms of ambient pressure and temperature, power settings, um, or you know, idle, you know, your car can't idle below a certain number of RPMs or the engine will die, um, all that stuff. And so all this stuff shows up here as well. So, well. so it turns out the combustor has really, really important effects on where your power plant can and cannot exist. So I flew here last night and it may well be that the combustor had no single order impact on cycle efficiency and how much gasoline that engine burned. But if that flame had decided to blow out uh, in flight, I, we'd all been hosed, right? You know, because if the flame blows out, all bets are off, right? The gas turbine generates no power. Um, and if, and the, the air zinging through that combustor, it's moving about 100 miles an hour. So I don't know when the last time anybody ever tried to light a flame in a 100 mile an hour crosswind. It's challenging, really hard. I've never tried either. But I have tried to light like my gas grill or, you know, trying to light, you know, a Bic lighter so you can light something in, you know, a small crosswind and you're like, the blasted thing keeps blowing out. Well, so that's a really a big one, right? And so that directly limits power density, right? Because if you, you want to get more power out of a smaller system, you gotta be pushing a lot of mass flow through it. And once you fix your cross-sectional area, that's, that's velocity. Um, so blowout is a really important operational limit. Um, another one is turn down. Actually, I'm sort of well, that's okay. I, I talk about all this more in my next slides too, but another one's turn down. So just like your car, imagine if your car only worked at 35 miles an hour, right? It didn't go 40, didn't go 30. Same thing with these. You know, you want something that can run at full max power. You want it to be able to run at 90% power. You want it to be able to run at 70% power. But at some point, that combustor is gonna set, set the limit on how far, how much you can turn that plant down, which has an order one effect on how our electrical grid operates today is turned down. Anyone know why? Yes. Yes, but you're, you're absolutely right. And so um, if the grid doesn't need the power, it doesn't need to turn on. But you know, why not be able to just idle your power plant at 1% overall power so you don't have to heat soak it in the morning? You know, you got these huge power plants and they're shutting them off. Emissions. Yeah, emissions go through the roof, exactly. At some point, carbon monoxide, CO goes, poof, it shoots through the roof, goes outside of the compliance window, system can't operate. Um, so that is why, and I'll show you some data uh, from real power plants. At some point, you gotta shut these things down just because of turndown. Um, 
So, and then transient response. Transient response is becoming more and more important. Really important aircraft engines, uh, you know, if you want to need to slam up or slam down on the, on the power settings. Um, you know, so take, I'll give you a simple example. It's, if you're not careful, you can lean blow out an aircraft engine because you have fuel, think about, you have a certain range of flammability of a fuel-air mixture. So you got, a, you got M dot fuel, M dot air. What controls M dot fuel? Pilot, throttle, right? Or um, you can change, and that's quick. You want half the fuel, fraction of a second, you can be delivering half the fuel. All right, what sets M dot air? Rotating turbo machinery, which is free spooling, right? You want half your M dot air, you got the time constant, the thermal, not the thermal, the, um, the rotating inertia time constant of that aircraft engine. So let's say you want to cut your power by a factor of two from your engine, so you, which means you're gonna need half the fuel. Well, if you just drop the fuel, bang, by a factor of two, you're gonna blow your engine out because you just dropped your, sto your equivalence ratio by a factor of two because the airflow rate's just not gonna adjust. So, so you basically have to adjust. In essence, what a, there's, a, there's a controller that's between what a pilot wants to do and what the engine's actually doing. It's basically matching the time constant of the fuel system to whatever the air system can do, or you'll blow your engine out. You, same with rich blowout. You know, you want more power, wham, throw, hit the throttle, you'll blow your flame out rich in a minute because it takes that, that turbo machinery a certain amount of time to, to spool up. Um, so those are some examples. Uh, then the last bullet says emissions from the plant. Now this, this is gonna be obvious, but this is really important. NOx emissions, particulate emissions, Socks, um, uh, you know, right now, today, there's a lot of really interesting questions going on around contrails, which is water vapor. You know, is the CO2 that's coming out of an aircraft engine have a bigger climate effect, or is it the water vapor interacting with um, PM precursors? Did, did Professor Michelson talk about contrails? Okay. Um, uh, probably the number one, one of the, the most impactful questions that's out there today around what we need to do to decarbonize aviation is, is contrails and what is the role of water vapor interacting with uh, aerosol precursors relative to CO2. Um, and the reason that's important is because people are like, hydrogen, let's think about hydrogen aviation. Well, if water vapor is, more, is a bigger climate forcer than CO2, then maybe, that's, maybe we don't want to do hydrogen <laughs> because you know, it obviously makes a lot of water. Um, so yeah, so th there we go. So just overall, so what are important combustor performance metrics? I've just, I've mentioned them all, but you know, here, here I have, here I just listed out. Obviously you wanna burn all the fuel. That's almost never an issue because combustion is high activation energy. It has this interesting feature that you're either gonna burn all the fuel or you're gonna burn none of it. You know, it's, it's you know, to, to first order. Um, it's really hard to only burn half the fuel. Um, it should ignite. Um, really, and, and that might sound obvious, but you know, there's a lot of, work going on right now, for example, the Federal Aviation Administration is grappling with the question of how do we certify sustainable aviation fuels, SAF. Um, because we have built an entire aircraft logistics system around fossil fuels. In fossil fuels, um, the jet fuel that we get from fossil fuels is not one compound, it's thousands of constituents, thousands of them. You can't match that, right? You can't match that. So you say, well, okay, we don't want to match those thousands of compounds, but let's try to capture some high level um, properties that will match. So density of the fuel, it's gotta be the same density. It should have the same heating value. It should release the same amount of heat. Um, viscosity, those kinds of things. Well, you can match all that stuff and it can still not work because it may not ignite, or it may be unstable, or it may make a lot more soot, or make a lot less soot. Um, and so one of the questions um, is ignitability. So an important feature for an aircraft engine is if the flame does blow out at altitude, it, an important design metric is it should relight. And you'll all be glad to hear that, is it's really important. We spend a lot of time making sure aircraft engines don't blow out, but then we also spend a lot of time making sure that if they blow out, the hot pilot hits that igniter button, and the flame comes back. And so, um, and it turns out that, as you might imagine, if, if uh, for example, high altitude relight, it's really cold, it's really low pressure, the fuel's not vaporizing that well. And so if you've got thousands or hundreds or even tens of constituents of your fuel, what's gonna vaporize first is not gonna be the average fuel composition. 
So what we, we sometimes, you know, there's what we call a distillation curve. So as you start heating the fuel up, what comes off first? And so maybe that first 5% of stuff that vaporizes, way, you know, in the tail, the, the, the lowest volatility stuff, which could be, you can have two fuels with r roughly similar properties, but the ignition properties of what comes off the first 5% could be profoundly different. Um, so this is, a, this is a super interesting question, sort of at the intersection of combustion science and sort of how do you certify an engine, where you've got this huge palette of potential fuels, um, and, then, and then what do they need to match? What needs to match so, so that the engine has the same operational limits as what it was designed for um, in the existing logistics system? Um, pattern factor, that refers to the temperature uniformity coming out of the combustor. Um, you don't want to burn a hole, even if the average temperature's whatever it is, you don't want to burn a hole through your turbine if you've got a, you got a hot spot. Um, I talked about operability, so operational limits. And so it turns out there's, there's really four key factors that li uh, whereby the combustor limits operational limits of the system. And those are blowout, which I already mentioned, one of them, flame blows out. Another one is combustion instability. We'll talk a good bit about that. This is where the, um, the flame interacts with the natural acoustic modes of the combustion system. The, the, a combustor in many ways is like an organ pipe. It has natural acoustic modes at which it oscillates. And flames are really, really powerful sources of, um, of noise. And so those two can give you, if you remember your controls class and your block diagrams and feedback, you can get, you can get monster feedback between those two and you can get huge oscillations. And so one of the biggest problems with today with low NOx um, combustion systems is that they're really unstable. So we spend a lot of time um, dealing with making them stable. Um, flashback. So as we'll talk about, to do low NOx, we usually premix the fuel and air in modern combustion systems. So fuel, air, premix, so you've got this premix passage here. Uh, and you need some time, some distance for this fuel and air to mix, because if it doesn't mix, you get higher NOx. Um, and, but you tell the flame, Please stay down here. Please don't come in here. But the flame wants to come upstream. And actually, well, that's some of the, it might want to shoot up the boundary layer. This is, this is today why, what, what limits the level of hydrogen that we can put in these things is the flame will just go, go you develop a system for natural gas and you just, if you want to, if you were to blow hydrogen in it, a second later, hot metal would be flying out of the back end of it because it would flash back and it would melt everything. Um, and then auto ignition. Uh, is similar issue, uh, di different different cause, same effect, which is that you get you get the flame in this premixing section, but it's where the fuel in the air just go bang. They auto ignite. So it's not that the flame propagates back; it's just that the flame spontaneously ignites. Um, and this is more of an issue with fuels that have a lower auto ignition temperature, uh, like jet fuels, for instance. L any most liquid fuels. Uh, when you vaporize them, have much lower auto ignition temperatures. Uh, I already mentioned turndown. I mentioned transient response. And then lastly, fuel flexibility. And I'll try to weave this throughout the class, is that sort of the palette of fuels that we're interested in today is just, it's really interesting. You know, we've got natural gas. That's the biggest source of electric power today in the U.S. is natural gas. We've got jet fuel. We've got diesel. But now we're also hydrogen. And hydrogen's a crazy fuel. I don't know. How many of you work on hydrogen? Okay. It's nuts, right? I mean, what makes hydrogen so much fun to work on is like, you've got all your fuels over here, they're cats, you know, hydrogen's a dog. It's not, it's not like a different breed of cat, it's just fundamentally different. It's got, it's thermodiffusively unstable, the turbulent, it, you know, we all know that it burns faster than natural gas, but that's only the start of the story, right? It's the flame is so darn thin that it can go blasting up any kind of boundary layer that would quench any other kind of flame. Or because of those thermodiffusive instabilities, if you put it in a turbulent flow, it's so much more sensitive to turbulence than a natural gas flame is that the turbulent flame speed, even if you match laminar flame speed, the turbulent flame speed can be three times higher. Um, and on and on and on and on. So hydrogen's fascinating. I'm glad to see you're working on it. because, um, Or, you know, today there's lots of discussion around ammonia. Uh, anybody working on ammonia? Yeah, ammonia is kind of a crazy fuel too, right? Opposite, it doesn't like to burn. Um, it doesn't like to burn. It's got, a, it's got a nitrogen atom tied to it, so it wants to make a lot of NOx um, and so forth. How many of you are working on SAFs, by the way? I didn't, I didn't raise my hand on that. Okay, good. Um, 
yeah, so anyway, so those are some combustor performance metrics. So just to, just to fix some notation, I just want to make sure that I'm going to use some words here. Uh, you all may know what I'm talking about, or maybe some of you don't, so I just want to make sure. But, you know, you've got to, in, in these devices, usually M dot fuel and M dot air is something that the combustor designer doesn't set. That's usually given to the combustor designer. Like if you have a have a aircraft engine, you've got to give it a certain amount of thrust, which means you're going to need a certain of M dot air and a certain turbine inlet temperature. So it's like, here you go. Give me this. You're going to need this much mass flow rate, and you need it, need it in this ratio. Um, and so, but there's different approaches for distributing that given M dot air and given M dot fuel to achieve a specified global stoichiometry, right? So we can put it all, we can make the fuel in the air premixed uh, like this. We can, we can dump it all in upstream and we're gonna run the system lean um, uh, in order for low NOx. Um, and um, there you go. And that's, that's one way to do it. Um, and the downside of this approach is, is that as soon as you premix a mixture, because of flammability limits, it, uh, you intrinsically limit the turndown of, of a, a premix systems have inherently lower turndown. Because if you want, if you've got, a, if you fix your mass flow rate of air, the range of mass flow rates of fuel, or, or therefore power, is controlled by flammability limits of your system, which are generally quite narrow. Um, and so that's, so you need, so these systems tend to be a lot more expensive, a lot more complicated in the field, because in order to turn down, you don't have just one fuel circuit, you've got multiple fuel nozzles, and you've got to adjust them and control them and tweak them. You know, lean premix systems are also prone to flashback, they're prone to auto ignition, but we're stuck with them because we got to, we, because NOx is so important. But it, from a combustion physics science research point of view, these are all great problems, great job security. Um, because these are really hard problems. Um, okay, non-premixed. This is where we say, hey, let's just dump the fuel in the combustor. We'll dump the air in the combustor. That's the middle sketch. We'll, they'll find each other wherever they find each other. Well, as you know, that's a non-premixed flame. Non-premixed flames burn at stoichiometry, V equals one, uh, where the majority of the air, if it's, if it's globally lean, uh, that just means the majority of the air doesn't participate in the reaction. It just kind of goes around and it mixes downstream. But because of that, these systems are, have lots of turndown. It's burning at F equals one no matter what, right? So if you want a quarter of the mass flow rate of fuel, turn down the flow rate of fuel, no problem. The flame just gets smaller. Uh, and so these systems are really flexible. You know, if you, if you look at power plants, older power plants, because, not, no one, because they make a lot of NOx, uh, much simpler fuel systems, only one fuel control valve. You just turn the fuel up and down to go up and, up and down in power. But, because it's non-premixed, you make a lot more NOx, you also make soot, um, and so forth. Um, then what you can start doing, and this is just one embodiment on the bottom right here, is you can actually start staging it in different ways. So for example, um, in our, what, what we would be called an RQL system is you'd run the primary zone, the, the upstream zone, fuel rich, and but you, you, know, you still, Presumably, you're going to be globally lean, so somehow you're going, to, you're going to need to get more air in. And so then you dump in a little bit of air, that secondary air downstream, and then you get a secondary lean zone. This is, this is a device that's used on almost all aircraft engines today because it's got a ton of turndown because you can run it. Um, that, that fuel flow rate, you can run it all the way. The front end can be lean at idle. At takeoff, you just dump all kinds of fuel the primary zone might go up to an equivalence ratio of three or four, and then you just burn the rest of the fuel in the secondary lean zone. Uh, these RQL systems are also, um, uh, the, you, there, it's, a, it's a way to, to, to manage NOx. It's not as, it's not as good as um, uh, premix systems, but, but it's a better way than just running overall non-premixed at, at some global stoichiometry. Um, alternatively, you could, and this is what's being used today in ground power systems, is instead of staging the air, you could stage the fuel. So you might inject maybe 90% of the fuel on the front end and 10% of the fuel on the back end. And why might you do that? Well, let's go back to that bottom right picture there, is, is that turbine, people who do turbine heat transfer are trying to crank up the turbine inlet temperature, up and up and up and up and up. Um, and so, when I first started doing combustion, or even 
10 years ago, we said, okay, well, how do we do low NOx? Well, we, we run lean premixed. Uh, that means we can control our flame temperature. And um, as long as we keep that flame temperature below, let's say, 1800K, which is a good number for NOx, um, we're not going to make much NOx. Well, turbine designers, that worked until turbine inlet temperatures exceeded 1800K. Now turbines can take 1900K. Well, how do you do low NOx at 1900K? Well, lean premixing alone isn't enough to get you there. Um, and so now we're in a, it's kind of interesting. It's, it's so this is my point about this is a really interesting technology issue, but it's also a basic science issue is that, you know, how do you minimize NOx? Keep the temperature down. Well, take that one. But it's like, I don't want the temperature down. I want, I want you to give me combustion products at 1900K. So, well, one way to do that, and probably the approach that's being, that I think the community is converging around is what we'd call an actually staged air system, a fuel system where you dump 90% of the fuel in. So you're, you're running lean premix system at 1800K, not making any knocks. And then you dump that last bit of fuel in just before the exit of the combustor uh, to give you that 100K bump. Because it's so hot, that fuel reacts really quickly, so you don't need that much residence time. And, as we'll talk about a little bit later, NOx production, or you may have already talked about this, Zeldovich NOx is a function of temperature, residence time, and O atom concentration, right? So it's reduced O atom concentration because it's in combustion products. Um, so NOx production rates go down, low residence time, which keeps NOx, the overall NOx production lower as well. So anyway, that's kind of an interesting, interesting way in which um, technology is heading. Um, and just to, just to give you a couple sketches, so for these non-premix systems, you know, here's a couple, here's a sketch of what these systems might actually look like. The top right shows an image of, um, so you have that diffuser. Air is coming out of the compressor. These diffusers just slowing the fuel, slowing the air down, getting the Mach number down. Otherwise, you have a lot of Rayleigh losses. Um, but only a, maybe 30% of the air will go in through the front end. The rest comes downstream and gets dumped in for cooling. And you have this primary zone. But you get this high temperature zone up front, and then but the, the temperature drops to whatever your your turbine inlet temperature is. Whereas if you're running a premix system, almost all the air goes through the front end. Um, in order to get whatever your global stoichiometry is and don't get that, that um, temperature bump. Um, I'm just going to jump over these, those slides because they just, I just show a couple different manifestations in the real world of what these look like. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, but I mean, the bottom line is, is that you know, really the challenge um, from a practical point of view is balancing all this stuff. Turn down, combustion instabilities, blow off emissions, but yet not making a system that's ridiculously expensive. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll just give you an example. So, like in the Europe in Europe today, um, NOx is regulated even for things like your home heaters or water heaters or things like that. And so, um, I heard a story from a, a company that makes small burners for these instant water heaters. Where I don't know if you've seen in these instant water heaters where you can actually get almost boiling hot water straight out of your pipe. Basically, it just fires a, a, a little burner, turns on, and it makes the water hot, so you don't have to wait to get hot water. Um, but that system was designed with, I don't know, it's a Belgian company, and it was designed with natural gas from Belgium. And then it was sold to households in Spain. And in Spain, they're taking gas from North Africa, which has a slightly different composition. And it turned out that, that, that the combustor became unstable. And it was a really high frequency instability. So the thing would screech at you. Um, so these, they were talking to me about, well, what can we do to deal with this combustion instability? Or, and so we were talking through solutions. But their, their ability to design around it was so constrained by this box right here. Because he's like, I got to be able to do it for less than 50 cents. Um, it's like, wow, that doesn't really give you a whole lot of options because we were talking about Helmholtz resonators and some different design changes. But, you know, that, so I'm just the overarching issue is you, you know, you got to do it within a certain cost constraint. Um, so maybe I'll just spend a few minutes talking about fuel comp. I've already talked about fuel composition, but just as I, as I mentioned, fuel flexibility is, um, is a big deal. This is actually an article from 2008 that talks about all the different kinds of fuels that one company, so this is solar turbines, it turns out, which makes gas turbines, um, that they were having to make sure that their engines could, could manage around. And today, 
14 years later, the, like I mentioned, the pallet's even bigger, you know, hydrogen and ammonia and, and whatnot. But basically, you know, various blends of, of um, methane plus higher hydrocarbons. Um, so actually, let me just jump to this slide. This is a slide from Rolls-Royce, Canada, which um, not only Rolls-Royce doesn't just make cars and airplane engines, they also make what are called aeroderivatives, which are smaller electric uh, uh, plants for, for mechanical driver electric power. And this just shows some of the gases that they've had to design their engines around. And um, you can see from the dots where the gas is being sourced from. Uh, the x-axis is percentage of methane. Um, the y-axis is percentage of C2+. So this would be ethane, propane, butane, etc. And if it's just hydrocarbons, you're going to lie somewhere along this black line. So for example, it might be 90% CH4 and 10% C2+. Um, and you can see a lot of the fuels kind of cluster along that line. But if it's not on this line, for example, on this line, then you have other stuff as well, which are usually inerts. So that's what this line right here, 15% inert. So you'll see that this, if you look, if you're on this line, um, the x and the y axis will add up to 0.85. So for example, 80, right, this point right here is 80 and 5. And so the balance would be things like CO2, nitrogen, steam, etc. And um, so, but anyway, as, as we'll talk about a little bit later, as you start going up in C2, you know, natural gas, CH4, actually has a really hot auto ignition temperature. So if you premix pure methane in air, you really have to elevate the temperature for it to, to auto ignite. Um, but as you start adding higher hydrocarbons, particularly as you start looking at propanes and butanes, auto ignition temperatures start to drop. And so that starts to create a challenge for premixed designs. And so that's, this is why they did it, because, because Rolls-Royce makes what we call aeroderivatives, which are ground power systems at really high pressure ratios. So if you're running at a pressure ratio of 40 or 50, it's both high pressure and it's really hot, compressed, uh, high temperature. And so premixing, Getting good premixing without auto igniting is, is a real challenge. So that's why they were showing this plot. And then um, this, this going back to this, this just shows lots of other different kind of different fuels that are that are looked at. Um, kind of another interesting one is landfill gas. Um, you know, most landfills today have some sort of power plant. Just you know, the anaerobic digestion of landfills produces methane, but then it also produces a lot of other stuff. So it might be 40 to 60% methane, but then the balance could be CO2. And so you're looking at a fuel with a really low heat content. Um, so, you know, if you just think about some of the different types of, of fuel groupings that are out there, this is kind of the, when I talk to people and they ask me questions about fuel flexibility, in my own head, I kind of have these three buckets. You know, the first bucket is, well, how, tell me about your higher hydrocarbons, you know, because in particular, as you start going up that hydrocarbon chain length, it, auto ignition becomes more and more of an issue. Um, or the other important parameter is hydrogen content, just because, like we said earlier, hydrogen is just such a different fuel. It, it's it, it's such so thin, it propagates so fast, it's so sensitive to turbulence. Um, what are your levels of inerts? You know, nitrogen, carbon dioxide, water. Those affect heat content. And all these things then have an influence on these different operability issues that I referred to before. Combustion instabilities, flashback, blow off, auto ignition, uh, carbon monoxide emissions, NOx emissions, and so forth. And then the other one, which is is becoming more relevant today, actually, there's a, probably a fourth bullet, which would be, what is the in at nitrogen atom? Um, are there nitrogen atoms in your fuel, particularly ammonia? Because then ammonia has its own own issues. Um, okay, so. Talking about, let me just, I'm just kind of, real quick, just so you can get the lay of the land here. I'm just kind of talking through all these different different combustion parameters. So I just talked a little about fuel flexibility and combustion architectures. Um, so I also mentioned combustion instabilities as being a limiter of, of operational behavior. Uh, and, 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 you know, this is what we call a transition piece, by the way. This is what connects the combustor to the turbine. That is not a cooling hole that shouldn't be there. That was a part that was vibrated loose by a really violent oscillation in the system. Um, and uh, just the designs of these systems make them very susceptible to large amplitude pulsations. This is a simulation, a CFD simulation, flows going left to right. Um, 
the yellow is the flame, the blue is vorticity isocontours. And what happens in this case is that you have the reactants entering the combustion chamber. Um, you get this, uh, you have the shear layer, and, the, and the, the shear layer rolls up into what we call the Kelvin Helmholtz instability. But then these acoustic pulsations start coupling with that shear layer. They excite these, these really coherent vortex rings. Those vortex rings grab the flame and roll it around and flip it around, and they cause the heat release to oscillate, which makes more, more sound. Um, and it closes the feedback loop. But we spend a lot of time thinking about combustion instabilities because they're just really sensitive to, to a lot of things. Um, I mentioned turndown, which is the ability to operate over a range of power settings. Um, so this is actual power from a real power plant, a very large combined cycle power plant. Um, and you can, if you, it, it, you see time in days, you see normalized load, you can see it's spending some time at full power, but it's also shutting, it's basically shutting down at night. And it's shutting down at night for the reasons that were mentioned earlier is you, there's really no cap capability to store the electricity it's making at night. A, B, the price of electric power makes it not economical even if to run at night. Um, and C, it can't just idle because it would make too much CO, so they have to shut this thing down. So this massive piece of steel, huge, multi, you know, like the, 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 the HERSIG, which is the heat recovery steam generator that's used for the steam cycle, this is like, you know, multiple stories. Um, they're turning that thing on and off uh, every day because of turndown, because otherwise you'd make too much carbon dioxide. Um, or we talked about transient response needs. Um, this is also data from a real power plant in Texas. Uh, now time is not in days, it's in minutes. And notice how power is swinging all over the place. And this is a power plant that is backing up a lot of wind. Um, and so again, increasingly, an important role for thermal power plants and combustion systems is going to be to provide firm dispatchable power for to back up non-dispatchable. So I don't know if you know those words, dispatchable, non-dispatchable. Non-dispatchable would be like wind and solar where you get what you get, right? The wind's doing what it's doing. You have no say in what the wind's doing. And the clouds are doing what they're doing for the solar farm. You get no say. That's non-dispatchable. Whereas a power plant like a coal plant, a hydro plant, gas plant, it's what we call dispatchable, you say, give me 90%, you give 90%, give me 95 So firm dispatchable power is going to be a, an increasingly important role as levels of um, non-dispatchable sources rise. But that creates these, these interesting transient response needs. And so what can happen, as I mentioned, kind of like the issue of blowout in an aircraft engine, is you just want to make sure that as you're swinging around in power, the system can do it, but that you're not going to be accidentally flashing back or blowing off your flame while you're while you're doing it. Um, I talked a little bit earlier about blow-off. This is kind of one of my favorite pictures that shows what blow-off is. I did not fly in on this airplane. That would have been really cool. But um, this, uh, this is the SR-71 doing a high G turn, and that's blow-off right there, right? The that's not where the flame's supposed to be. You know, the, the flame has left the building. Um, and, uh, but that's blow-off, right? And, uh, the, and, and by the way, in that engine, the air is going through at like 400, 500 miles an hour, really whipping through there. So just how do you, how do you stabilize a flame under those conditions is a, is a, is a real challenge. Um, this one on the right is, uh, I, I, I keep this binder of where things that I work on show up in, in uh, kind of either the popular press or people who don't do combustion. So I found this one. This is NERC. North, this is an organization that has congressional authorization for maintaining reliability of the U.S. electric grid. And they put out an industry advisory, this is in 2008, about a, a grid fault in 2008. You see all this grid nerd talk, the first, which doesn't, I don't understand any of it, the first paragraph. But I do understand that bullet of why six combustion turbines operating in a lean burn mode, which is used for reducing emissions, parenthetically they tell us that, uh, tripped offline as a result of a phenomenon known as turbine combustor lean blow off. Um, so, and then you, I won't get into the reasons, but essentially, again, remember these lean premix systems have um, only a certain flammability range, and so you start changing things a little bit on them. Uh, they can blow out if you're not careful. So a lot of, a lot of interesting science issues there. Um, okay, uh, let's spend a little bit of time. I'm going to jump ahead because I'm talking too slow, because so I need to get through this in the next 20 minutes. Let's spend a few minutes just talking about emissions. Um, and just raise your hand for me. How many of you are pretty familiar with basics of NOx and CO and particulate emissions? 
Okay, so about half. So I will, I will spend some time on this um, because this is such a driver for so many of the things that we talk about. So when we talk about emissions, um, usually these are the things that we worry about. NOx, and the, and the X stands for either NO or NO2. Um, and those are reactions of nitrogen with the oxygen in the air. So air is N2 and O2. Or if you have nitrogen in your fuel. Carbon monoxide, um, another regulated pollutant. That comes from incomplete combustion or rich combustion. Unburned hydrocarbons would be just any other kind of fuel fragments that, that don't get burned. Uh, SOx, that would be like the X there stands for SO2 or SO3. Um, becoming much less of an issue, but if you have sulfur in your fuel. Um, so most natural um, fossil fuels have a certain level of sulfur. Any kind of manufactured fuel today uh, will have zero sulfur, which is, by the way, one of the big benefits of using like a sustainable aviation fuel, you know, derived like via fish, what we call Fischer-Tropsch process relative to conventional jet fuels, you get no socks. Um, then you get particulates, which is just, you know, um, fine particles of, of particularly uh, carbonaceous particles. And then, you know, uh, obviously you make CO2, and then I mentioned earlier there's this, this outstanding question about water with aircraft engines and just kind of the role of the water vapor and interacting with with particulates in the role of, of climate forcing there. Um, so just as a quick reminder, this is from Steve Turns' combustion book. If you think about major products of combustion, uh, here's a plot. Uh, you have temperature on the top right. You know, temperature peaks near stoichiometric. You see water and CO2. You know, again, those are major combustion products. The job of a combustor is to make as much water and CO2 as possible, because if you're not, then you're making, you're essentially wasting fuel. And then um, down here, you can see oxygen. So you always have a certain amount of excess oxygen um, if you're burning lean. Uh, and obviously, as, you soon, as soon as you start going rich, you don't have excess oxygen. And this excess oxygen is important because particularly NOx, uh, post flame, you, you, most NOx is formed in real systems after the flame, and it comes from reaction of this ambient O2 right here with ambient N2s. Uh, and where's N2? N2s right here, this dashed line. Um, and so that's driving NOx. And then if you're on the rich side, you'll have carbon monoxide and hydrogen. So I don't care what fuel you burn. If you're burning it rich on the, um, on the rich side, you're burning carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And I, by the way, I bring this up at, at all the time at um, Air Force contractor meetings because people people say what what why do we care about hydrogen why do you why are you studying hydrogen combustion you know the Air Force burns liquid fuels and I say well actually the Air Force uses RQL combustors um, the secondary stage is burning hydrogen and CO so the Air Force is actually in the business of burning a whole lot of hydrogen and CO blends so and by the way we call hydrogen and CO blends synthesis gas or syn gas uh, so syn gas is super important for any system that's going to be burning rich such as an RQL type system. Um, okay, well then we can think about minor products. So this is equilibrium. So minor products, and so just a, the big caveat here is usually minor combustion products are not at equilibrium. But this at least tells you that if you give it enough time, where is it trying to go? And so you can see on the lean side, you do have equilibrium CO. You do have, you have non-zero levels of equilibrium CO. And CO levels are dropping as we lean the system out. Um, we have, you know, OH, and we have H atoms, and we, there should be an O atom in here somewhere as well. O, again, actually, I mentioned how O2 is important. Really, what import, is important for, for NOx production is O atoms, because Zeldovich NOx is, is teed off by N2 plus O, goes to NO. And so it's this, it's this equilibrium O in the, in the exhaust that gives you NOx production. Um, well, let's just spend a minute talking about I want to talk a little bit about NOx. I want to talk a little about CO because I'm just going to keep coming back to these because these are such important forcers. So, you know, NOx stands for nitrogen oxides. And one important thing to remember about NOx formation is there's lots of different mechanisms to form it. And in my world, I like to differentiate between what's formed in the flame, you know, where you have all these exothermic reactions and these over you've got these big spikes of all these intermediates that then 
go to, to go to relax to equilibrium. And then you've got stuff formed post flame. So all the heat release is essentially done, but you still got hot combustion products and you're, you're making NOx. Um, and so post flame NOx is generally a function of resonance time. Well, it is a function, not generally, it is. And so kind of a simple formula, if you were to just to fit data or a calculation, is just A plus B times tau is generally a really good model if you want to fit NOx data. And then A is your flame NOx production, and B is your NOx production rate, and tau is how much time you give it at a high resonance time. And so NOx, uh, particularly if, if, if a lot of your NOx is coming post-flame, which it would be in any kind of um, practical high combustion system, you want to minimize resonance time. So short, short resonance time, um, short combustor, because that gives you low NOx. But as we'll talk about, the challenge with that is you can make a lot of unburnt hydrocarbons and CO. Um, but you know, then, the, then I have here some of the different mechanisms um, by which NOx is formed in the flame. And I'm not going to get into those, but um, and these have different sensitivities to stoichiometry and equivalence ratio and temperature. And then you have post-flame, which we sometimes, and the most important mechanism there is usually what we call Zeldovich NOx or thermal NOx, which is NOx that is, um, which I have over here, uh, where you have, I just jumped ahead two slides, by the way, um, where, you know, which is initially, you have N2 in the air. And remember, N2 has a triple bond. N2 doesn't like to dissociate. It's really hard to dissociate N2s. And so, which is why, you know, we're not forming NOx today in this room. Um, you know, the N2s and the O2s are happily coexisting as N2 and O2. It's got to be at high temperature, and then you've got to have some O atoms floating around. And, but that, that kicks it off, because then you get NO, and it gives you an N atom. And then that N atom reacts with O2. But this one, this one right here is really what's initiating the whole thing. And this thing has a really sensitive to temperature. And this thing really only starts to turn up above a temperature about 1800K. Right? And so, and that's, again, why that has, this reaction one is what has driven, if you look at proceedings of the Combustion Institute or Combustion in Flame, and you just look at the papers, all the interesting science problems that have arisen out of the need to A, premix, and then B, keep these things at low temperature, you know, problems of flashback and autoignition and combustion instability, all come back to, to this. Um, and the other thing about this is that, you know, this is a, uh, that, that reaction rate one increases exponentially with flame temperature. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, you know, if you just run the numbers, you know, you really start to, rates really start to take off at temperatures above about an 1800K. So you got to keep your flame temperatures down. And so in older systems, the way they do that is they run non-premix and they dump in water or steam or CO2 um, or nitrogen, if you had nitrogen, um, just something to keep that flame temperature down. Um, and, but kind of the standard approach, as I mentioned, is what is some, oftentimes called DLN, which is dry low NOx. And the D, the dry, you can now understand because earlier approaches used wet. They used water or steam. And this is some data um, just showing some NOx measurements as a function of temperature. This is a log plot, but just kind of if you perfectly premix the system, uh, you can see this exponential dependence. If you don't perfectly premix, even at the same flame temperature, you're going to make more NOx. Like here's perfectly premixed. This is kind of whatever a good mixer is. This is poor, a poor mixer. But if you're not pre perfectly premixed, you'll have local excursions from your nominal stoichiometry. So if the, if the average equivalence ratio is supposed to be 0.7, but it's actually burning between 0.65 and 0.75, well, the 0.65 is going to make less, the 0.75 is going to make more, but because it's exponentially sensitive, you make a lot more at 0.75 than you make less at 0.65. And so, which is why, again, from a, from a technology point of view, kind of up until, I don't know, five, eight years ago, all the technology was going into premixing. But now we're at temperatures way up out here where you're starting to make a whole lot of knocks, and so we have to do more than just premix. Um, and this, as I mentioned before, you know, kind of a, a good model for NOx production rates is A plus B times tau. This is just a simple Chemkin calculation of methane air, uh, just showing you what I meant by that. These are different temperatures, so you see this bump, uh, and this is tau, tau uh, 
resonance time. Um, you see this bump here. This is in the flame itself. So if you were to look at like heat release rates, you'd see the heat release rate from the flame spike and then go to zero. Um, and then you see it linearly rising. And this is basically Zeldovich Knox. Um, and then, and so you can see the slope increasing with temperature, and that's due to this exponential temperature sensitivity. And, um, and again, depending on resonance time, depending upon temperature, the, um, the dominant source of NOx could come from what's in the flame or post flame. And so this is really important. If, if any of you are working on this topic as you're, as you're analyzing NOx measurements or reporting NOx measurements, um, and thinking about these different sensitivities, it's really important to um, contextualize you know, what's coming from the flame itself, what's coming post flame, because at the end of the day, you're gonna be making measurements with a given resonance time. And if you wanna extrapolate your results to a different resonance time, you know, if you're at 1700K, let's say a lot of your NOx is coming from the flame itself, so you're gonna get a pretty much the same answer if you run at 10 or 15 milliseconds, whereas at 1900K, it's post flame, so if you put, report your data at 10 milliseconds and someone else wants to say, what does that mean in 15 milliseconds? So that's, that's why that's important to understand, understand this. Um, and, but I would say, generally speaking, kind of the numbers I've seen is that kind of atmospheric pressure systems like you know, water heaters for your home or whatever, uh, boilers, you know, these systems, oftentimes dominant NOx um, in those systems is usually flame NOx, whereas uh, high pressure sort of industrial power type applications or aircraft engines is, is post flame NOx. Um, so that's NOx. By the way, I'm just gonna try to power through this. I know that we um, are supposed to be done right now, but I got, I'm just gonna, just to get through the emissions part. Um, let's just talk a little bit about carbon monoxide, but, but the same kind of idea I think would apply to a lot of combustion intermediates. And even if you're thinking about ammonia for those of you thinking about com ammonia combustion, you know, there's a lot of concern right now about N2O emissions, which is also, you know, post-flame N2O levels are, are, are really small, but if you don't fully oxidize it. But, you know, a simple two-step conceptualization of carbon monoxide formation is the fuel decomposes and you get lots of CO. Any hydrocarbon, you're going to have tens of thousands of parts per million of CO in the flame, even though equilibrium CO levels might be a few ppm. And that is because any hydrocarbon once you heat it up, it's not going to be a hydrocarbon anymore. It's going to be hydrogen and CO. And so, for example, if you have a flame, here's CH, this is X, this is just a premixed flame calculation, uh, Chemkin calculation. This is mass fraction. Um, my mouse? No. Sorry, I'm pointing at my screen, which is not your screen. Tell me when you see the mouse. There it is. Okay. Um, so, um, there is methane, and you can see it's dropping. But combustion products are water and CO2. They don't exactly rise at the same time. Rather, what happens is, is that you get this bump in hydrogen right there, and you get this bump in CO right there. And so this methane is, is, is reacting. It's decomposing into hydrogen and CO. And then hydrogen reacts to form water, and CO reacts to form CO2. So that's kind of your, uh, what's, what's happening in the, in, the, in the middle. So that's step one. And then, and then step two is where that carbon monoxide reacts and it forms CO2, and it's, it's heading towards equilibrium, and usually equilibrium levels are really low. I showed you those levels. Um, but if you don't give it enough time to get to equilibrium, um, and the, that, that relaxation time is a function of temperature, right? So as you drop temperatures, equilibrium CO levels will drop, but it also means it takes longer to get to CO. Um, or quenching near walls, right? So anywhere near a wall, you can, oftentimes that's where CO comes from. Um, so, you know, just to give you a, a, here's another calculation, a comparable calculation just to illustrate this. This is carbon monoxide parts per million um, versus residence time. So let's look at this 1500K result. You see the spike, uh, 10,000 ppm of CO. That's a lot, that'll kill you. Um, and then it relaxes down towards Equilibrium. Well, let's look at 1900K for a minute. It's all happening a lot faster at 1900K, so it's all getting compressed, right? Reaction rates are way up. But you get this spike. You actually don't make that much more CO, a little bit more. Um, maybe 15,000 ppm. Then it relaxes to equilibrium. And so, and note the equilibrium levels are 
higher than at 1500K. But let's suppose, I mean, this is a lot of resonance time, by the way. You know, kind of a, an aircraft engine resonance time would be five to 10 milliseconds. Uh, a industrial power plant might be 20 milliseconds because, hey, time's money, right? You know, you, you, big, high, these are big pressure vessels. If you gotta make the thing twice as long, it's, it's high pressure, expensive alloys, etc. So let's just say you were running at, I don't know, let's, let's look at the, um, let's just say 30 milliseconds resonance time. So you'd actually get most, the most CO at 1500K. And that's, that's a kinetically driven phenomenon. Even though it, it, if, you gave it at, if you gave it 50 milliseconds, 1500K would be the lowest. But you know, basically, what you, you would see would be this non-monotonic. At 30 milliseconds, what you would see would be uh, CO levels would go from here, and then they would drop, and then they would rise. So in fact, CO would go down and then go back up. And this is exactly what we see experimentally, by the way. Um, I'm going to jump ahead two slides here. But um, this is real data from a real combustion chamber, CO emissions. Y-axis is CO emissions, X-axis is equivalence ratio. Three different pressures. Notice as we're dropping equivalence ratio, CO levels are dropping. That's equilibrium. Um, that's what I showed you here. When we were looking at these equilibrium CO levels, CO levels drop. Um, and by the way, the reason it's dropping from equilibrium is the reason you get equilibrium CO is because some of the CO2 is dissociating. You take CO2 and you put it at a high temperature, it's going to dissociate. And as temperatures are higher, you get more dissociation. Temperatures are lower, it's lower dissociation. So really, this stoichiometry dependence is a temperature dependence, is that the leaner flames are lower temperature, less dissociation. Um, so, but you get this CO wall, and CO just goes crazy. And so this is, in real systems, that limits turndown, right? Because you can only operate, um, and, and in reality, what usually happens in real combustion systems is not so much flame blowout that happens first, it's CO levels go through the roof, and you just can't operate there. Because um, CO levels take off, and then a little bit earlier, it would, it would blow out. Okay. Um, I'm going to tell you what, I think I'm going to, um, let's just stop there. It's 10 o'clock. So we have a 15-minute break, and we will reconvene at 10.15.